You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Well, it is good to see you this evening. If you would, please look to the book of 2 Thessalonians. Tonight we begin our study of this book by looking at the first four verses. We will read beginning at verse 1, read down to the fourth verse. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is only fitting, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of each one of you all toward one another increases all the more, so that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have again to open your word and study it together. Again, Lord, we ask for your gracious help, both for the preaching of the word and the receiving of it. We pray that your spirit would serve as our teacher, working in our hearts and minds, giving us strength to grasp the things that you've revealed for our good, for the spiritual good of your children. Lord, through the preached word, would, would you apply your word to our hearts in a way that helps us, in a way that helps us both in terms of correction and a way that helps us in terms of, of encouragement and strength, in a way, Lord, that affects the way that we live and walk. And in that way, Lord, we know that you will give to us what is good for us and what is for the glory of your great name. And we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How is the church doing? This is a common question you meet with whenever you meet with pastors from other churches. We all know when we ask that of one another that it's a question that what we really mean is, how do you perceive that the church is doing? Because we know that none of us is qualified to really judge how the church is doing. I often think about the seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. I think about Christ giving his assessment of each of the churches. I'm quite certain that some of what he shared they were aware of already, but I'm also certain that some of what he shared must have surprised them, perhaps shaken their conscience a bit, brought to their attention things they knew but they weren't really focused on. No, the only one who's, who's worthy and capable of completely, rightly, perfectly judging how we're doing spiritually individually and how we're doing spiritually as a church is the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that emerges when you remember that and when you look at the churches of the New Testament is that sometimes our sense of how the church is doing is really an underestimation of what a complicated issue this is. Sometimes what we're guilty of, both on the individual level and the collective level, that is, how is another believer doing or how is the church doing, sometimes what we're guilty of is measuring that only in the terms of apparent problems. If someone has no noticeable areas of concern, if a church has no noticeable areas of concern, then you say the church is doing well. 
But when you begin to see problems emerge, struggles taking place, even sometimes some stumblings and some failings, then we're prone to conclude that person's not doing well or that church is not doing well. And what I want to suggest tonight is the truth is never quite that simple. Is it possible that a church can be doing well in an overall sense right as it is facing some very serious challenges? I mean, the church is doing well, but it is, it is facing some, some very real taxing tests. Is it possible for a believer to be doing well in an overall sense, even as they face some very real spiritual struggles? The answer from the book of 2 Thessalonians is yes. Because in this letter we see the Apostle Paul rejoicing over the good work of God in the, in the lives of these people, marveling at what the Lord had done in this church and what He was doing in this church. And yet at the same time, we find in this letter that He's going to have to address some very real concerns and offer some very real correction. Some of that concern was at the level of doctrine. We'll see how there was confusion when it came to the matter of eschatology, the day of the Lord. But that doctrinal confusion had led to some behavioral problems. And so here is a church that has some real doctrinal struggles going on, some real doctrinal confusion taking place, and a church where there were people being unruly and in need of correction. And yet listen to what he writes in the fourth verse. He says, so that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Despite the concerns, despite the confusion, despite the need for some correction, this was a model church in many ways. It was doing well. And I would just remind us that that really is the nature of the Christian life, even at its very best, even when we are spiritually strong, even when we are spiritually mature, we will never reach a place where God's good work in our lives is not being tested. We'll never reach a place where we're not sometimes failing. We'll never reach a place where we don't need to grow. So that what was true of the church in Thessalonica is true of this church, and what was true of believers in Thessalonica is true of me and true of you. We are all a work under construction. Most scholars believe that this letter was written very shortly after the first one. Similarity of language and basically the repetition of the very same issues that you find in 1 Thessalonians showing up again in 2 Thessalonians leads us to believe it was probably written only a few months after the first letter. What it also reveals is the very things that Paul had addressed in the first letter he's having to address again. So they're continuing to struggle in some areas that he has already addressed. You'll remember in the first letter, there's some, some instruction given about the return of Christ. In the second letter, again, he's talking about the day of the Lord. So there's still confusion there. In the first letter, he talks about unruly members and the need to discipline them. In the second letter, he spells out with specificity what that unruly behavior looked like. And so here's a church, a model church in so many ways, but they are continuing to have struggles both on the doctrinal front and the behavioral front. They're being tested. And through those tests, there's an additional test that he mentions. That is, they happen to be suffering. They are the target for some very powerful and painful persecution so that this model church was a suffering church. So tonight we begin to consider it. We begin to think about this. And what I want us to begin with is recognizing two things 
that characterized this exemplary church even while it was being tested. We're thinking about the proving of God's work. Here's a church that is proving God's good work in them, and yet at the same time, the perfecting of God's church. So a church can be an evidence of God's powerful working even while it is being developed itself, even while it is under construction, even while there are things that need to be addressed. This was a church doing well overall, but it was not a church without struggles, not a church without problems, and that is the Christian life. So two things that characterize this exemplary church even while it was being tested. The first thing we see tonight is found in the third verse. Paul writes, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is only fitting because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of each one of you all toward one another increases all the more. First thing we can say about this church is this, the exemplary church, this exemplary church, progressed, they grew despite being tested, severely tested but still making progress, severely tested but still growing in the Lord. Here was a church in the proverbial crucible. The Lord is sovereignly, through the circumstances that He is allowing, He is turning up the heat on this church. From the, from the devil's perspective, those tests were meant to destroy. From the Lord's perspective, those tests would serve to purify the church. I want you to remember, churches never suffer by accident because our God is sovereign. He says in the fourth verse, he says, so that we ourselves boast among you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. You are enduring a very difficult season. When Paul writes this, it's a church that had already been tested. They were being tested in the first letter. And here they are continuing to be tested. And yet the apostle is aware of good fruit so that he's full of thanksgiving. We ought always, verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is only fitting because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of each one of you all toward one another increases all the more. What is he thankful for? What does he see? First thing he mentions, he is thankful for and increasing faith. Your faith is growing abundantly. One of the sovereign gifts imparted through suffering is the gift of circumstances in which the Word of God becomes more tangible to us. We, we've heard it with our ears. We've learned it in our minds. But walk through a test, walk through a fiery trial and now you have to live out certain truths that you can't experience in any other setting. Suffering is not only the stage upon which God puts His glory on display in what He produces in His people, it's also a stage upon which His people learn things they will not learn any other way. Which is why we're continually exhorted that when we go through various trials, we're to be a people who rejoice because we have a knowledge that God is sovereign over those trials and He's at work in and through those trials for our spiritual growth. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial which, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. I mean, the glory that will be on display when Christ is revealed is the very same glory that's being put on display as He works in you and through you in the midst of your tests. 
You're, you're experiencing something now that you will rejoice in fully when He is revealed. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. There's a sense in which God, God's presence is known. His hand upon us is experienced through suffering that is unique. So when we believe God in the face of real testing, including severe persecution, if we believe God through those tests, we will emerge from those tests with a greater, uh, a greater faith, a greater appreciation for our God, for His truth, and a greater apprehension of those truths because now we've had to live out things we didn't have the opportunity to live out before. Trusting God, believing God, relying on the Lord, finding our joy in the Lord, finding our comfort in the Lord, realizing that we're living for eternity, not for the moment. These are the sorts of things you learn in a very experiential way when you go through trials. So you emerge stronger. And this is a church that was experiencing just that. Your faith is growing. And it doesn't just say it's growing. It's growing abundantly. There's an overflowing sense of what you're learning right in the midst of these troubles. And in that Paul found a reason for great thanksgiving. But not only were they growing in faith, they were also growing in love. Because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of each one of you all toward one another increases all the more. He's not just talking about love for God through the trials and love for the truth through the trials. He's talking about love for the church through the trials. The church is suffering. The church is being tested. And through those tests, what he was aware of is that the people of that church were being galvanized. When a church goes through testing and it's not believing the Lord, it's not trusting the Lord, those tests can lead to division. But when a church goes through testing and together we trust the Lord, believe the Lord, rely on His Word, what does that do? It brings us together. It produces greater unity. Or to say it another way, we, we learn to love each other more, to sort of lean on each other more, to assist each other more, to encourage each other more. And so here's a, te here's a church in the midst of this crucible of testing. God has allowed the heat to be turned up. And yet God is being proven. His, his good work is being proven through the testing because the result of the testing is not destruction and not disunity. The result of the testing is progress. It's growth. Growth in faith and growth in love. And so Paul is thankful. He says something about his thanksgiving. He, he feels obliged to give thanks. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is only fitting. We ought to do this. Th this speaks of, of an internal sense of compulsion. When I see what the Lord is doing in His church in the midst of its testing, there's a subjective sense of obligation to lift my heart and my mind and my voice to God and to give Him thanks but he not only mentions that subjective sort of sense of obligation, he also mentions an objective one because he, he adds, this is fitting. We ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is only fitting. This is right. So joined to that subjective sense of obligation is an objective sense of obligation. Why do you feel compelled to give God thanks, Paul. And why do you say it's right that you should do so? Because he understands the relationship between doctrine and doxology. He knows that when you see increasing fruit right in the midst of the heat of battle, when you see increasing fruit right in the midst of, of very difficult tests, the only explanation for that kind of fruit is God. 
The only explanation is the, is the reality of regeneration. I mean, where does faith come from? It comes from the work of the Spirit in a human heart. God has made you a believer through the new birth. Where does love come from? Love for God, love for the truth, love for his people, love for the brethren. Where does that come from? Comes from the new birth, comes from the new creation. And so what he's saying is what I'm seeing are the realities of salvation. Here you are in the midst of severe testing, but what has the result been? Not a tearing down, but a building up. And not in some small measure but an abundance of fruit. Your faith is growing exponentially. Your faith is growing abundantly. And notice, this isn't some occasional example of love within the church. He says the love of each one of you all toward one another. He says it's church-wide. I mean, I I look at the church, I'm hearing reports of what's happening in the church, and it's a church-wide growth in the area of faith and love. Well, who do you thank for that? You thank the Lord for that. So it's, a, it's an obliged thanks. It's a fitting thanks, a subjective necessity, an objective necessity. A good reminder to us that if we really know truth, we know doctrine, it does lead to praise, doesn't it? When you, when you realize how God works, then when you recognize His work, you give Him the thanks that He's due He also says it is a constant thanks. Verse 3, we ought always, always to give thanks to God for you, brothers. At all times, on every occasion, at every bit of fruit that we witness, at every moment we call to mind how the Lord saved you, has kept you, is developing you, Every time we come face to face with the work of God, we ought to give thanks to God. And he describes it in the language of of something that's constant. I, I just want to remind us that if we have the eyes to see it, if we have the eyes to see it, there is always good reason for giving God thanks. All day, every day, there are things in our lives and around our lives for which it is right, it is fitting that we give God thanks. Can I just ask you, are you characterized by a life of thanksgiving? Are you someone whose eyes are open, doctrinally open, so that you recognize the connection between what's happening in your life, through your life, around your life, you connect it to what God has revealed about himself and about his sovereign working in the world so that you are living a life of constant thanksgiving because God is always working in a way that is worthy of thanksgiving. Healthy churches are thankful churches because they're well-instructed churches, but they're also alert churches, alert to God's working in them and around them. And no doubt his thanks is also fueled by the knowledge that the Lord has answered his prayers. Because what we saw in 1 Thessalonians is he had prayed for just this. He had prayed that their faith would increase. He had prayed that their love for each other would increase. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. I know that's not a direct correlation to what we're studying here in 2 Thessalonians, but it is related. I desire that the Lord would allow me to be with you. Why? Because I want to see your faith grow. I would like to make a contribution. I would like to be used by the Lord to see your faith grow. He's still praying for the growth of their faith. And what an amazing and humbling Reality to recognize he wasn't able to get there, but their faith still grew. The Lord isn't dependent upon one servant in order to do his work. So his heart is full of thanks. He wasn't able to get there, but their faith has still grown. And then in chapter 3, verse 12, he says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. I pray for your faith to increase. I pray for your love to increase. Here is a church now suffering, still confused in some areas, still needing some correction. But what do you see? You see an abundantly growing faith and you see love for each other. 
on display all over the place throughout the entire congregation. God has answered the apostles' prayers. Are you alert not only to what God is doing in you, through you, around you, are you alert to how He's answering your prayers? It's kind of humbling sometimes, isn't it? When you see something happen and and it jogs your memory that you had actually prayed for that. Like you prayed for it and you kind of forgot about it. But there it is. Oh, we we need to stay alert, dear ones. We need to stay alert. We We need to lift our prayers to the throne of grace. But then we need to watch with a sense of expectation, knowing that if we're praying according to the will of God, He hears us and He answers. So the first thing you see about this exemplary church, even as they are being tested, is they grew. They grew spiritually. They grew in their faith. They grew in their love. I pray that for us. I pray that that those twin graces would be always on display in this congregation, that we would be growing in our trust in the Lord, but always in a way that includes warmth for each other that we would be a church that learns the truth but never loses a growing love for one another. A learning church and a loving church. That's a healthy church. And that's what you saw in this church. The second thing we see about this exemplary church, not only did it progress despite its tests, it persevered despite its tests. Verse 4, so that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God for, what are you bragging on us about, Paul? Here's what I brag on about you, for your perseverance and your faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. I'm sure there are many things he could have mentioned that would have made them worthy of imitation. But what he emphasizes, you know, what I'm, what I'm really thankful for, what, I, what, what I'm really giving God thanks for, but what I'm also praising you for is that you are proving yourselves faithful. You are persevering in your faith. You are enduring in the midst of your trials. The result of God's good work in this church is that they now were being used as an encouragement to other churches. We boast about you where? Where are you giving this report? Among the churches of God. We're using you... God's good work in you to encourage God's good work in other churches. You do know that's not automatic. I mean, just because a church is being tested doesn't mean that automatically that church will prove faithful. Just because a believer is being tested, it doesn't mean that automatically the believer, in that moment in history, that the believer will prove faithful. Again, I take our minds to those seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. They did not all receive the same assessment, did they? Some were found faithful, some were not found faithful. Some were commended, some were so seriously warned they were even warned that their presence as a local congregation could cease to exist. Not not the loss of salvation, but the loss of a congregational representation, that that could go away. Conversion is monergistic. Regeneration is something God did all by Himself in you. You had no contribution to make. But even as we were reminded this morning, progressive sanctification is synergistic which means that faithfulness in the Christian life is synergistic. 
yes, completely reliant upon the Lord, His power, His working, but there are still choices, decisions that you and I must make if we're going to be faithful. Obedient choices. There is no faithfulness apart from faith, and our faith is not of the living sort unless there is obedience. Living faith is obedient faith. It's possible to have a living faith and yet in the moment not exercise that living faith because you're not obeying the Lord. Faith requires submission to Scripture, even when submission to Scripture is costly. Have you ever been faced with a decision to obey the Bible and you felt the weight of that decision? If I obey this, it it will probably prove costly to me in the temporal realm. Have you ever had that experience? Well, there's no way to pass the test unless you're willing to embrace the cross. No way to pass the test unless you're willing to embrace, in their case, persecution, mistreatment, severe testing. Will we prove obedient in the face of mistreatment? Will we prove obedient when it's painful to obey. So here's the amazing thing. Paul is praising God for that church, but he's at the same time praising the church to other churches for their faith in God. This is a godly kind of boasting. Paul is saying, in effect, I'm, I'm proud of you in the Lord. I'm thanking Him for His good work in you. It's only explained by Him, but I'm also proud of you for your faithfulness in this season of testing. What do we learn from that? What can be said of this faithful church in Thessalonica and any church like it? We want to be a church like this. We too want to be an exemplary church. We want to be a model church. What do we learn about churches like this? Well, as I've mentioned, I just want to underscore it. Faithful churches are humble churches instruments of exhortation. Faithful churches God uses to encourage other churches. You know this because you've heard it often. I mean, one of the churches God has used to encourage this church is Grace Community Church in Southern California. How many churches has that church been used by God to encourage? You think about embracing things like a high view of God, a high view of worship, a belief in the sovereignty of God and salvation, a plurality of elders, the exercise of church discipline. You think about all the things that that healthy churches are required to live out. How many churches has that church been used by God to encourage as they embrace that pathway, as other churches embrace that pathway of obedience? Too many to number. And believe it or not, dear ones, The Lord has used you. The Lord has used this church to encourage other churches. And that's what we desire. We desire to be faithful to God in a way that His name is exalted, not ours, but that He still might use us to encourage other congregations. That's not a bad desire. That's a good desire. And it's something you see in the New Testament. You see other examples of this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Verse 1, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. By the way, this would have been one of those churches. I find it interesting the way he introduces that. We talked about this when we preached through that section. It's really not so much a testimony about the churches as it's a testimony about the grace of God that was on display in and through the churches. That's the right way for churches to be a humble example is we're really an example of the grace of God. I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. Their giving reflected their poverty, but their giving was still well beyond what you could have humanly explained. Here they were contributing to an offering for poor saints in Jerusalem when they are poor, when they don't have anything. 
For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of, of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. We're not only willing to give of our money, we're willing to give of ourselves. How can we help? What can we do? Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you, Corinthians, this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. I want to use what God has done in those churches to stir up God's work in you. I want their love to stir up the genuineness of your love. So God takes churches like the church at Thessalonica. He takes exemplary churches who grow in faith and grow in love in the midst of their testing. What does he do with them? He uses them as humble instruments of exhortation to other churches. That's what he says about this church. What is interesting, though, is, is how he says this, because notice he says in verse 4, so that we ourselves boast about you among the churches of God. We ourselves boast about you. Well, who else would be writing? I mean, who else would have been boasting about us? You're the one writing the letter. Why do you say it like this? I, I think what he's emphasizing is, I know you wouldn't say this about yourself, this is what we have said about you. And by the way, this is what characterizes churches that really are healthy and growing. This is why I say humble instruments of exhortation. When a church is ready to set itself as the example for all other churches, it is probably not the example it imagines itself to be. But when other churches are being exhorted by someone outside the congregation, using the congregation as an example. Now, that's something that is to the praise and glory of God. Someone has seen something in you. It's not you saying it. It's them saying it as they have witnessed God's work among you, then using you as an instrument of the Lord to encourage another church. You see, that, that is how this ought to work. I love what William Hendrickson wrote about this. He said, the idea seems to be one of contrast, not of resemblance. In other words, the meaning is not we like others who have heard about you, in which case we would have expected, he, he talks about the technicalities in the Greek language. He says, nor is it we of our own accord, not simply saying we've done it, but we on our part over against you on your part. The missionaries must have heard from the Thessalonians since the first epistle was written. Naturally, the genuine believers in the recently established church were rather restrained in speaking about their own spiritual condition. They were humble, ready to admit that even the most devout among them were still far removed from the goal of spiritual perfection and that some in the congregation conducted themselves in such a manner that the others felt ashamed what do you mean you're bragging on us? Don't you know what's going on here? I mean, don't you know we have people who aren't even working as they claim to be waiting for the return of Jesus? Don't you know about the doctrinal confusion in our... What do you mean you're bragging on us? Hendrickson, Hendrickson is saying probably the apostle had heard from the church itself nothing of this glowing sort of self-appraisal. Over against this, Paul, by way of encouragement, says, we on our part boast of you. That's glorious, isn't it? When people see wonderful things in your life that can only be explained by God when your view of yourself is small, that is glorious. And that's what God produces in faithful churches, a glorious beauty that is matched with a glorious humility. And not a humility that is, that is worn, not a humility that is fake, a genuine humility that flows from a heart of gratefulness for God's love and His mercy and His kindness and His patience and His 
forbearance with us and his enduring work among us to, to know all the areas where we need to grow and yet God's hand is still upon us and he's still working in our midst doesn't make you feel like a model. And yet others can see his beautiful work in your lives so that you can be a model. That's what was happening in this church. So what, what do you say about churches like this? Well, faithful churches are humble instruments of exhortation. Faithful churches are also characterized by endurance. We boast about you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. The idea is a capacity to hold out or to bear up in the face of difficulty. Patience, endurance, fortitude, steadfastness, perseverance. Not just faithfulness, but faithfulness with longevity. Faithfulness over a period of time. Faithfulness that lasts. Continuing to be faithful when the difficulty won't let up. Continuing to be obedient in a way that is impossible apart from believing patience. Faithful when what you're facing is not like a rainstorm, it's like a hurricane that has done what happened here in Houston many years ago. It's just settled on us. It won't move. And it keeps raining and raining and raining and raining and raining. Sometimes churches face trials like that. They meet with problems, persecutions, difficulties that just don't seem to go away. And this church found itself in the midst of long-lasting difficulties, yet they were growing in their faith, in their love, and they were persevering. They were enduring, holding up under the weight of the test. And Paul gives God thanks for this, even as he praises them, because God is always the explanation. God's faithfulness is always the explanation for our faithfulness. How does any redeemed person remain faithful? Answer, God is faithful. To make a stand. He is able to cause us to stand. He is able to fill us with endurance. We ought to celebrate that. In fact, it ought to make us slow to pronounce a kind of final condemnation when it comes to someone else's failures. You like that sometimes? You ready to give up on a person spiritually? I'm talking about someone who, who professes to be your brother or sister. And you're just ready to throw them away. Maybe their failure is especially grievous, but you're just ready to throw them away. Or you see their acts of immaturity. You see sometimes what we could call spiritual stupidity, and you, you just you have no patience with them. Romans 14 verse 4 ought to slow us down. It says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Maybe you've come to the conclusion that he won't last, but Paul says if he's really your brother, he's going to last. The Lord will hold on to him. He's able to make him stand. Romans 16.25 says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. To him who is able to strengthen you. To him who's able to make you stand. 2 Corinthians 9 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, 
you may abound in every good work. God will make you an instrument for good work because your sufficiency is found in Him and His grace. And it's a sufficiency equal to whatever you face at any time. Are you convinced of that when it comes to your brother's and sisters, I mean, this, this is what you find in faithful churches. You find patience with each other, but you also find this divinely taught hopefulness when it comes to each other. I'm not able. They're not able on their own. But, Lord, you're able to strengthen them. You're able to cause them to stand. You're able to finish your good work that you've begun in their lives. You're able. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I'm telling you, dear ones, meet with unhealthy churches. There's a spirit of cynicism, almost depression. It's dark. It is doubtful. It is condemnatory. Meet with a healthy congregation. It, it is not light on sin. It does confront sin, but in a way that is both gentle and believing. We believe what God is able to do in human beings' lives. And in that way, we confront sin. And in that way, we deal with sin issues, knowing the ability of our God. Jude 24, we read it this morning. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Faithful churches, instruments of exhortation, able to be used by God to encourage other churches. Faithful churches characterized by patience, by endurance. Not only endurance under the trial, but as we bear up under the trial, patience with each other. Not only is there a growing faith, that would speak to our holding up under the trial, there's a growing love, which means that the troubles are not dividing us, the troubles galvanize us. Say it another way. This flows through those two thoughts. Faithful churches are characterized by loyalty to the truth. What is endurance under trial? You say it's it's ongoing faithfulness to Christ. That's true. What you can also say is it's ongoing faithfulness to the truth. Faithfulness to Christ can't be divorced from faithfulness to the truth. So in the midst of this church's sufferings, what were they doing? They were remaining faithful to Jesus, yes, which means they were remaining faithful to the words of Jesus, to the words of God, to the words of the Scriptures. They were being faithful to the truth. It is our Lord who prayed for us. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Paul writing to Timothy when he was in the midst of a trial in 1 Timothy, wanting to leave Ephesus, it was so hard having to tell him to stay put more than once. That's how hard it was. And he says in chapter 3, verse 14, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth. What is the church's function in the world? To uphold and defend the truth of God. What I'm saying to you is this, endurance in the midst of a trial can never be separated from sound doctrine. The endurance that God grants to His people is an endurance found as we believe the truth. Faithful churches are faithful to the truth. After all, what is being tested? Especially when you talk about persecution, what's being tested? Are you willing to sell out to the culture? Are you willing to abandon the truth to make it easier for you? And by the way, that's the very test you're facing wherever you're facing fear in your relationships. It may be with mom or dad or brother or sister or someone you know has been critical of you. I just want to ask you, are you willing to abandon the truth 
so that they will, quote, love you, think more highly of you, be more willing to be around you. I mean, if you'll just sort of take a step away from the things that bother, you, bother them about your belief system, you'll certainly find it easier. So are, are you willing to do that? Again, I want to be so careful. I'm not talking about people who are overbearing with truth, trying to deal with truth in a way that doesn't represent the Spirit of God, doesn't represent Christ. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about some sort of proud, arrogant sort of thing. I'm saying there you are simply being humbly faithful to your Lord and to His Word, and you are hated for it. Now, all you have to do to relieve that is take a step away from it. Are you going to compromise? You can't, can you? So endurance, faithfulness, is faithfulness to the truth in every one of those situations. The church cannot sell out to the culture. The church cannot allow what God hates. Now, I've talked about the seven churches twice tonight, but let me do this once more because it's amazing what you find in those, in those seven evaluations because to the churches that Jesus gave commendation, it's amazing how those commendations had to do with doctrine, had to do with their relationship to the truth. Listen to this, Revelation 2.13. This is to the church at Pergamum. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. What's the praise for? Fidelity to the truth. What's the correction for? compromise with the truth. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, unacceptable. The result has been idolatry and sexual immorality. And the Lord Jesus calls that church to repentance. Another example, Thyatira, Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. I think it said these were in the categories of praise. These are actually in the category of correction, but there was even praise there in Pergamum for fidelity to the truth. Listen to Thyatira, Revelation 2.20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each, each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. You've held to the truth, I don't hold you responsible. Those who have compromised the truth, so serious that he threatens some of them with death so that all the churches will recognize that he's the one who searches the minds and the hearts of the people in his churches. Listen to his praise for the church at Philadelphia. Revelation 3, verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you 
from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. What, what is the Lord praising in his churches? Faithfulness to the truth. What is he rebuking in, in his churches? Compromise when it comes to the matter of truth. And so this is what you see in an, an exemplary church as it's being tested. You see endurance, faithfulness, and faithful churches are churches that endure in the way of the truth. Loyalty to the truth characterizes faithful churches. Instruments of humble exhortation characterized by endurance, characterized by loyalty to the truth. One final thing we will note about faithful churches, they're characterized by all of this by patience, even as they are targeted with pain. Interesting, isn't it? He mentions persecutions and afflictions which you endure. In the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. Persecutions. The yogmas is the Greek word. Listen to what the lexicon says. A program of systematic harassment because of differing belief or or another way to say it, expression of persecution on the basis of belief. So you have enemies of the church who systematically aim at making the church's life difficult because of what the church believes. Afflictions, philipsis is the word, trouble that inflicts distress. So, so he's describing the program and the pain, programmatically attacking the church. The result is that the church is being afflicted. The church is experiencing pain. And yet the church, this church, bears with that in a way that reflects Jesus. In the face of hostility, they reflect Jesus. Even as they are hurting, in the face of that hostility, they reflect Jesus. It's a model for all of us individually, isn't it? We won't be this as a church if we're not this as individuals. When you're the object of someone's persecutions, when someone wants to make your life difficult because you love Jesus, when someone wants to make your life difficult because of what you believe, when you are being persecuted in all of its various forms so that it causes you pain, I mean, it, it is disturbing. Are you enduring it? in a way that gives testimony to the Son of God? In a way that speaks of the love of God? In a way that speaks of the grace of God? In a way that speaks of faithfulness to the truth, not just truth communicated, but truth embraced for your own living. I'm going to live the truth in the face of this difficulty. I'm going to live the truth in the face of this pain. This is what characterizes faithful Christianity. So what are we reminded of tonight? Faithful churches are not perfected churches. How's the church doing? Well, actually, I'm not the one qualified to give that assessment. However, I know what faithful churches look like. I know they're not perfected. I know they can be healthy even when there's confusion. I know they can be healthy. They can be exemplary even when there are issues within the church they have to deal with, behavioral issues. Some needing correction, some needing discipline. But I know this, if it is a healthy church, it's a church that grows, even when it's being tested, grows in its faith, grows in its love. And it's a church characterized by long-lasting faithfulness. Fidelity to the truth, it will not abandon the truth, even when it's hard, even when it hurts. And you see that on display over a long period of time so that God uses that church in ways it would never consider itself. It's not bragging on itself. 
but the Lord is using that church to encourage other churches because of what other people see in that church's faithfulness. That's healthy, faithful church life. As I said, it happens one life at a time. So Lord, strengthen us to live that out in a way as close to me as me. Strengthen us, Lord, to believe you even when we are in the crucible, even when the heat has been turned up, even when we are tempted not to. Strengthen us to believe you and to obey you. And in that way, together, make us a church that thrives in the midst of testing. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the exhortation we meet with at the very beginning of this letter. Thank you for a, a, a church that you that, that spoke of, testified of, not only your powerful saving work and your sustaining work, but also testified, Lord, to, to your developmental work because though there were problems there, Fruit was still good. Fruit was still apparent. Fruit was still multiplying. And Lord, we pray that that's what you would do here. That you would work in us in such a way that we would not have a, a sinfully high view of ourselves, but yet in some way, Lord, your work would be so evident in us that we would encourage others. Whatever our tests are, Lord, grow us through them. Let our sorrows not be wasted. Thank you that through the things that hurt, we come in contact with your word in, in ways that are experiential that we could not know any other way so that our faith grows. And Lord, when those times happen, help us to draw near to each other, even as we draw near to you, and to love each other zealously, fervently, from the heart so that we're patient with each other and enduring with each other, knowing that you are able to make our brothers and sisters stand. We'll give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.